Good afternoon and now evening. Uh, the main question that we're going to be talking about today uh, is can we help people be more effective and as a consequence help save lives. The Haiti earthquake um, in January 12, 2010, let's see if this goes, there we go, uh, exacerbated an existing humanitarian emergency uh, already in Haiti. And the international community, both professional and volunteer, responded in a remarkable fashion. New technologies were leveraged, particularly in social media, and we had effective transboundary communication across domains and organizations to an unprecedented degree. 230,000 or so died in the first 72 hours. As many or more were injured. Thousands of response personnel appeared from across the globe. As of January 20th, a week after the quake, there were 43 international urban search and rescue teams and more than 1,600 search and rescue personnel. There were at least 122 live rescues that were documented. U.S. teams were responsible for 42 people found alive. And within all of that, a new information ecosystem grew. The INSTED team was on the ground 60 hours after the earthquake, and we served to coordinate some of the humanitarian technology activities. This is Nico Dittada and Eric Rasmussen of INSTED on the Port-au-Prince airfield, who were deployed with the Thomson Reuters Foundation AlertNet team, who ran the emergency information service. They were working closely with Map Action, a British mapping NGO, for the UN Search and Rescue Dispatch Center. Here, they were providing the affected population with a service, empowering them. On one side, we could get information or ask questions. On the other side, this enabled data collection and action, so it was truly two-way interaction. What we have here is Project 4636. There was an international uh, short code set up. You text to 4636. Haitians and responders texted in. Messages were translated, geolocated, and verified, and teams were then dispatched. It was an ad hoc, complex ecosystem that required the coordination of a few dozen core people, hundreds of volunteers working 24-7 around the world. Ultimately, the system moved towards sustainability, with everything happening through Haitian channels. The U.S. State Department helped organize and coordinate the whole way from a strategic level. The Coast Guard and Southern Command served as entities that took messages and acted upon them to the best of their ability. It's important to remember that there were hundreds of people on the ground doing all of this the old-fashioned way. The tragedy was that we didn't bridge the old and new parallel ways of working often enough. Haiti was a phenomenal opportunity to move into this new world because of a benign environment, a tremendous U.S. military presence, the diaspora, large flows of money. This isn't true everywhere. Um, we've seen the new path. What I have up on the screen now is the old and by far the most dominant way of doing business, sheets with contact information. You walk around and you find the right tent. It's as simple as that. Now, how do we take the lessons from Haiti and develop techniques, policies, procedures, and law? There are many lessons under discussion, and I'm going to mention a few that I consider important over the next couple of minutes. Um, and what we have here is so that when you go back and look at the slides, there are the policy recommendations in full, but for time, we're going to go to the short and sweet. Cloud-based information is one of the few data management options in challenged environments. We need national and international agreements that embody the best thinking from both the response agencies and the areas of our own country that are most vulnerable to disease outbreaks and disasters. Information is critical in emergencies. We need to help response professionals for diseases, disasters, and even post-conflict environments gain a broader understanding of how, why, and where information is moving so that they can do their jobs rapidly and effectively, including protecting those vulnerable to information security risks after the responders go home. Here we have surgery done in the open at the Manusta Trauma Receiving Center um, in Port-au-Prince on January 17th. So, how do you get written health records on an amputation bandage into a technical system for action and review? We want information for community um, and for continuity of care and rebuilding of health systems. For decision-making and prioritization, we need data in the aggregate. And, related, how do you ensure that the information content extracted from a bandage is accurate 
and actionable, and the next level of medical care will get the information they need. So this leads me to my next guideline, transparency versus privacy. International, national, state, local, and tribal guidelines and agreements should be developed where they don't exist, then adopted and incorporated into systems that recognize the tension between the two, transparency and privacy, and the need to address each with variable weight depending on current circumstances. Part of the success was that texts, when they went into the system, were passed around with names and phone numbers. Now that's good because people could call back and follow up. This spawned a person-to-person -person assistance cycle. But person identifying information is something you don't want becoming public. Hence, we're stuck in this tension. If, it, if we were talking about Darfur, Iran, or Pakistan, this is not a benign security environment. So who holds the data, how do you share it, and how do you clean it? Interoperability. In Haiti, we've seen, for example, that we need medical records that can talk to spreadsheets, spreadsheets that can talk to databases, databases that can talk to maps, maps that can talk back to medical records, and so on. So um, can, we need to continue seamlessly through the necessary and predictable tasks. An important digression, the best maps um, that existed with urban street and building information following the earthquake were developed as a result uh, and through uh, open source systems that were free and available to use globally. Um, but in at least one case, the US military did not have access to these. So we had to bring an actual regular old laptop onto a Navy ship, beam um, Wi-Fi from the shore to the ship in order to make good things happen. Human interoperability. Uh, main example from Haiti. Um, good friend Nigel Snowd, who was here earlier today, was running the information management system for the UN response. But even so, he was not able to build the bridges between the 4636 group, the technology community, and what was happening on the ground. The main reason, he didn't have, and we didn't have, processes in place beforehand. Time, pressure, lack of processing systems held him back. The only way to make progress in the field is if you can give responders um, something that they can use. So you show up and you make their life easier, good things happen. Uh, this is Nico again, um, and the local cell phone that allowed 4636 to get started. Instead can provide SMS messaging through our GeoChat system for more than 150 countries, but service costs are high and not under our control. The cost is a reporting impediment, and it should be eliminated as soon as local carriers are up and running. Short codes, a single brief number like 4636 that you can remember when you're hot, tired, sweaty, or if you don't speak um, or read or write a language well, um, are essential, but they can also be a difficult bureaucratic, bureaucratic process and they need streamlining. Now, if you don't use it regularly, you will forget. Um, we must always be thinking capacity building um, and exit strategies from the start. Uh, we need to empower people and we need to get out. Government doesn't have to build and run these tools. Government needs to be a partner to help facilitate their use legitimacy, and adoption. Instead's effort here in Gov 2.0 takes several forms. One form might be described as our researching how we can use modern tools to better protect citizens for whom we all are or choose to be responsible. Efficient transboundary information flow, as an example, helped us find these orphans in Port-au-Prince. We think further work um, on moving information across boundaries in crisis is, is certainly worth attention um, and we'd be happy to discuss it further. Thank you.